The voice of Sherry. Do you understand? Hello, you with Gauri today at Durian ASEAN. It's a beautiful Tuesday morning, and we'll be starting with our news today. Uh, I have a morning quote for you by uh, Maya Angelou this morning. It's This is a wonderful day and I have never seen this one before. So it's a beautiful quote that uh, suggests that every day is, is a new day and it's a wonderful day for a wonderful start. So I hope all of you have a great start uh, to your morning. So over here with me, I also have uh, Osmod who is joining me today. Hi, Osmod. Hi, Gori. So uh, he'll be helping me out with the news today. And uh, so let's move on to our first news, which is reported by The Star where religious officers stop Chinese funeral to claim body of convert. A Chinese funeral was interrupted when uh, Penang Islamic Religious Department officers appeared at an apartment in Mecklenburg Street to claim the remains of the deceased. The, z- the disease, identified as Tio Cheng Cheng, 38 years old, was apparently converted to Islam 17 years ago. Her Muslim name was uh, Nora Tio Abdullah. So after several discussion with the police, Teo's family allowed the officers to claim the body. The coffin was moved into a van belonging to the religious department at 3.50 p.m. It is also learned that the coffin would be taken to the mortuary pending further developments. The family members said they would pursue the, the matter in court. So according to this news, the funeral was actually uh, stopped halfway so the religious officers can confirm if if the deceased was uh, a Muslim or or not. So uh, don't you think this is taking it a little too far, Osmod, to actually uh, interrupt somebody's funeral and uh, trying to decide if they're really Muslim or not? Yeah, it can be quite a sensitive issue just for people, especially at the time of funeral and death. Yeah, um, it might be something we should probably keep an eye for, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know if you know that, but uh, the religious issues are usually uh, quite rife in Malaysia, where race uh, is a big deal, actually. Uh, I think the moment, the first question everyone asks you when they meet you is like, are you Malay, Indian, or Chinese? And the next thing that comes is actually your religion. They just they just have to know what, what your your religious status is. Yeah, it's something I've noticed in my past few days here. So it's quite interesting, yeah, just to observe that as a foreigner too. Mm -hmm. So the next news is uh, about Thailand, where the Thai junta to explain itself to human rights group. So I'm I'm glad that the human rights are finally uh, interfering in this matter because it's getting really out of hand. Mm -hmm. So the the headline reads, Thailand's junta yesterday said it has ordered the Thai ambassadors to the United States and Britain to meet a human rights group in an effort to create understanding about its seizure of power last month. Mm. And uh, several Western governments have spoken out against the coup on Monday, tw- uh, May 22nd, calling for a, needy, a speedy return to democracy. And this rights group have also urged the ruling National Council for Peace and Order to curb its powers to detain and prosecute civilians. The NCPO has ordered Thailand's ambassadors in New York and London to meet representatives from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International to create understanding. So uh, what do you think about, about what's going on in Thailand now, your, your view on the matter? I think I just read uh, somewhere yesterday that the junta actually called the ambassadors mm-hmm. to pressurize its critics uh, abroad. So okay. we might have two contrasting versions of the same story here. Mm-hmm. So this one says, hey, like, you know, it's trying to create understanding, quote unquote, about the Caesar in power last month. Whereas the other version says, hey, like, it's probably trying to curb his critics. So it's just interesting how the junta is trying to legalize itself. Yep. Although, like, it's clearly a coup now. So I don't know, like, how much... Uh, uh, how successful would it be in future just to legalize this action? And this uh, coup was actually, when the military took over, it's supposed to be a temporary thing. Uh, they said they were just going to restore uh, peace and order to Thailand, but they're slowly kind of, I think, marking their territory and strengthening their position. And it's probably going to be a long-term thing in, in Thailand now. 
and the people are obviously not happy about it as as we've been we've been reporting it's not uh, something unusual in thailand well, but definitely for, but, but this time i think they haven't promised the elections anytime soon so that's well i think i read somewhere that it they are not going to allow any elections ex- for at least another one or two years so that's quite concerning for mm. people like who want to exercise their democratic rights oh uh, well yeah exactly and even with uh, everyone protesting they actually limited like the number of uh people where not more than five people can actually uh group together mhm uh so there's another news with us uh and it's from vietnam mhm so vietnam is uh, uh the headline says vietnam soccer tycoon new zen duc kien gets 30 years and the news is uh new zen duc kien is jailed for 30 years and fined dollar 3.5 million for tax evasion and illegal trading Where the story gets interesting is Mr. Kien is a former ally of PM Nguyen Tan Dung. Uh some of the allegations some see the allegations as politically motivated uh-huh. as Mr. Kien tried to weaken the power base of Mr. Dung. So it's interesting like how people like form coalitions and once they get outside right. their circle group and all the allegations about corruptions right. and defamations come to the surface and suddenly they're like the the bad guy there and uh mm-hmm. all, all these charges uh, are going towards them just because they are not a part of of the group anymore mm-hmm. uh yeah, it might be true might it might not be true that mr kian actually mm-hmm. you know did did something like if it is taxes but uh, only time will tell how much is it like politically charged and how much is it not okay Uh moving on to Cambodia now as reported by Radio Free Asia where uh Cambodian Prime Minister denies that the country is losing its boundaries to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And uh this justification comes in the midst of opposition accusations which claim that the government has failed to act on loss of its land. Mm. The accusations surfaced at an event held uh by Khmer Krom activist at Phnom Penh. Uh the temple is seen as a storage base for members of uh the Khmer Krom. The Vietnamese ambassador in Phnom Penh argues that the Kampuchea always belonged to Vietnam and never belonged to Cambodia in the first place to lose. Mm. So I guess this is another uh territorial or uh what you call borderline dispute in in Southeast Asia now first we had uh Manila, Philippines and China, then we had Vietnam and China and now we have Vietnam and Cambodia. Mm-hmm. Uh this is very interesting cuz like the concept of nation states you know it just emerged in like the 20th century Yeah the nation states I think this uh accusation is actually probably uh something to do with the ethnic politics related to uh Khmer Krom which are a minority in Vietnam mm-hmm. and the human rights watch are also observing that the group has faced uh some serious restrictions of human rights expression in Vietnam mm. and this particular claim by the opposition seems to lean towards garnering support from from uh, Khmer Krom as well and i think the opposition leader has also promised to give citizenship to like maybe 500 of the Khmer Krom oh, okay. from vietnam if they mm. come to cambodia oh so from vietnam to cambodia <laughs> yeah. okay interesting uh, even though they are like cuz they are a minority there and is It seems it's clear that uh they have serious restrictions in their human rights mm-hmm. as quoted by the Human Rights Watch in based in the US. Okay. Yeah. So moving on to uh Jakarta now. More protection needed for peatland. Activists suggest that converting peatland into palm oil fields may have long-term environmental consequences. And peatlands are considered one of the most efficient carbon sinks in the ecosystem. where Indonesia has 21 million hectares of peatlands that absorb approximately 1600 tons of carbon per hectare. So I think this is a very interesting topic because we also uh, talked about it uh last week here about preserving uh the wetlands uh and the peatland how it's important to balance uh, our ecosystem what are the benefits of actually uh preserving it and uh so i guess it's good that jakarta is actually also realizing the importance of uh preserving uh the peatland 
Yeah, but this is mostly argued by the activists, mm-hmm. I think, whereas the government, it just wants to focus, on, not just once, but like it primarily oh, okay. wants to focus on industrialization. Uh, so are you aware, like, were there any such uh, scenarios in Malaysia? Um, well, I do know that... Uh, because Malaysia has rainforest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we do have all these uh, programs, all these NGOs coming up uh, to increase awareness because not a lot of people are aware of... Uh, preserving the peatlands and, and even the wetlands itself. And uh, I think with all this uh, in pursuit of development and and uh, making more money, we're actually uh, covering up all these peatlands, claiming lands and uh, trying to build more houses, shopping malls and all. And these activists are actually trying to maybe not put a stop to it, but just trying to uh, curtail the, uh, the amount of development that's happening because... Uh, these peatlands are actually very important uh, for our survival. I think like what it says that uh, it's one of the b- uh, largest uh, carbon carbon sinks. So not only that, it also uh, regulates uh, the water. It, it preserves the, the wildlife, not wildlife, sorry, uh, the, all the living organisms uh, in the water. And it also... Uh, filters the air. It does a lot of things uh, for us humans, and I think, well, like you said, I guess the activists are actually trying to uh, fight for the peatlands, but not not yet the government because the government are still focused on industrialization as opposed to uh, sustainability and uh, the kind of green development and all. Even when you talk about development, mm. uh, like we as common citizens. We want development, and we want right. like our country to like quote unquote, our country to be quote unquote developed. Okay, that's the term we use. Mm-hmm. But there's also another side to it, uh, which we most neglect. So I think the activists are trying to highlight this issue, and mm-hmm. it's something that uh, developing countries like say Malaysia, Indonesia, and many of the Southeast Asian countries should try to probably keep in mind while they try to develop mm-hmm. their infrastructures so that it is also sustainable in the long run. Do you think it's possible to really strike a balance between development and, and keeping things green, uh, uh, protecting the environment? I don't think we have any other choice. <laughs> <laughs> we have to. But is it possible to f- to find that, that, that middle line, that uh, to not go overboard and, and destroy, destroy I, the I environment? I think uh, we in Southeast Asia are trying to emulate the development that say, mm. the countries in the West have done over 200, past 200 years. Uh-huh. And we're trying to catch up with them in like 20 or 30 years. So our pace is like enormous and it's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that the Western countries are have like developed themselves in okay. a sustainable way, but they have bought themselves time to develop alternatives but we have not. Like China uses coal just to like supply most of its, mm-hmm. its electricity. Mm-hmm. And we know about the case in like smog in Beijing and the level of pollution in yep. the country. So just to like sustain our development, I, like, I think we don't have any other alternatives in the long run. Uh-huh. If we are to develop in the way that we are doing now, we have to find ways. So we have to develop alternative ways. Uh, for development in order to still uh, protect our ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Uh, talking about that, do you want to read the news about Brunei, which is also related to environment? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, according to the Brunei Times, MIPR wants coral studies in school syllabus. So the Ministry of Industry and Primary Resources is actually looking to introduce the newly launched Coral Conservation Awareness rehabilitation and enrichment program into their school curriculum or as an extra curricular activity. And uh, this MIPR uh, minister, Yang Berhormat Pain Orang Kaya Seri Utama, Datuk Seri Setia Haji Yahya Begawan Mudim. Okay. Quite a long name. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought Malaysian ministers had long names. Yeah, so wow. uh, well, apparently he said negotiations are going on with the Ministry of Education to support the program, including making corals as a topic of research for undergraduates. And this coral care program was launched yesterday to increase public awareness of the importance of coral reefs and set Brunei as the premier location for coral conservation and rehabilitation in the region. So it's it's good that uh, they're trying to incorporate it into the school curriculum because I always think that uh, whenever you're trying to educate 
uh, someone on a particular subject, it's always good to go back to the most primary basic level and try to introduce it uh, there when you know when they're still young, when when they are still uh, not to say immature, that they're they're still uh, open to learning and they don't have a lot of uh, preconceived ideas yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be helpful just to educate and target kids because mm -hmm. they are the ones who are going to, like, it's a cliche, right? Because they are the ones who are going to run the country. Yeah, after that's, all, right, that's end, right. It's it's very much a cliche term, but that might as well be true now. Do you know much about the coral uh, conservation here? Um, I hope to learn more. I think, uh, well, we do have a couple of uh, uh, similar efforts in Malaysia because we have all these uh, beautiful islands like Perhentian and all, and... The, the corals are actually, uh, how do I say it, uh, pretty damaged. Uh, and a lot of people are trying to increase this awareness and trying to protect these coral reefs because they are one of, one of our assets, actually. Uh, it attracts tourists into the country. And uh, I think uh, Brunei is, is doing uh, the similar thing now, but they're going to go ahead and say that they're going to do it so well that they're going to be the, the prime example in the entire uh, region for this uh, coral coral protection. Oh, if Brunei does it successfully, that might as well set a precedent for countries like well, Malaysia. Well, that's that's right? very true. Yeah, so if if they do actually go know. ahead and do a very good job, there's there's no reason why we cannot look up to them and and mm -hmm. take 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 what we can from them. If Brunei is something we'd probably want to look up at, there's another news that we probably don't want to hear, but it's still mm -hmm. it's a news. It's okay. about Taliban socks, right? Pakistan with prison attack. It happened yesterday in Karachi, where the Pakistani Taliban yesterday claimed responsibility for a brazen overnight assault in Karachi that stretched into the morning in which gunmen infiltrated Pakistan's largest international airport and waged an extended firefight against security forces that resulted in at least 27 deaths. Mm -hmm. What do you think of it? Uh, I think uh, according to Mr. Shahidullah Shahid, who is a Taliban spokesman, he said the main goal of this attack was to damage the government, including by hijacking planes and destroying state installations. And uh, they also said that we will continue carrying out such attacks, although he insisted that the group was still seeking to uh, resuscitate peace talks with the government. So I find that uh, very contradicting, of course, uh, when they are looking to have a peaceful talk with the government and at the same time they're saying that we will continue such attacks uh, to uh, intimidate the government. And yeah. also in a mm -hmm. possible uh, change of tact, the Taliban said that its mission was to hijack a plane, a break from its usual uh, pattern of roadside bombs and suicide bomb attacks. It's quite serious that the terrorists use like mm -hmm. attacking people as a... Just as an excuse to fight against "quote unquote" government, right? Yeah, exactly. And just like kill innocent, take innocent lives. Uh, I don't know if that will help them in the long run, just to get support of the people. And he's mentioned that you know they are probably gonna focus more <coughs> on like say hijacking planes. Quote <laughs> <laughs> I know it. Um, it's as if they're saying like, "Oh, this is not so bad." You know, it's not like. Uh, we're sending out a suicide bomber or something. We're just hijacking a plane. Oh, yeah, that's it's quite dis <laughs> disconcerting. It's it's very disturbing, mm -hmm. actually, to think about it, that uh, they would go to that extent just to uh, show their protest. Because if we were to compare it with what's happening in Thailand, how uh, the people there are protesting, although they're not happy with the military, you know, they're reading books like uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. They're using the three-finger sign for Hunger Games. Whereas here, it's like, all the way to the extreme where they're actually hijacking planes and then they're saying that, well, it's not like uh, we're having suicide bomb attacks or something. It's just hijacking a plane, mm -hmm. which is which is a bit of a change from uh, what we usually do. Uh, and especially maybe it's quite more concerning for Pakistan because it's also a uh, nuclear powerhouse mm -hmm. with India. That's so right. I wonder what that would play out in like, what what effects it would have in regional politics if the Pakistani Taliban get uh, become more prominent in the region? Right. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next news, which is from Manila. It seems that uh, the daily Manila commute is the worst ever, reported by Philstar.com. And with the population in Metro Manila now estimated at 13 million, 
the congestion can only get worse, especially with the opening of uh, classes and the influx of students from provinces and the working people who rely mostly on jeeps and buses to bring them to work. And also uh, the heat, the pollution and uh, the grindingly slow pace of traffic all add to the agonizing conditions that uh, these commuters have to go through every single day. Something that could be avoided if they actually had an efficient and reliable public transport system. So I think there are two very important points here. And one is about uh, how Metro Manila is getting overpopulated. And another one is also about the public transport system, which I think is a similar problem that we're facing here in Kuala Lumpur itself. So uh, what happened with Metro Manila is that uh, because of all these, well, we do know that People in the outskirts of the capital city usually try to get into the capital city to look for a job or to send their kids to school because uh, they have uh, a higher chance that way, a better chance for a more quality education maybe and, and probably a better job with a higher salary. But then again, they're all um, congesting the city. And I think I read uh, last week that the Manila government is actually trying to do something about this. They're trying to build more schools, trying to build more houses because there are a lot of people even living on the streets. They're, they're so poor. And at the same time, uh, all these commuters are finding it hard to, to go to work every day because there are just so many of them and... Uh, the, it it uh, affects the traffic really badly. Oh, talking about traffic, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I left home at like 5.30 today in the morning. 5.30? Yeah, just wow. to get some bus. Uh, I realized how, I hate to say this, but terrible the tra- public transportation is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Kuala Lumpur at least. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not like... Really <laughs> the buses. Well, I guess yeah. the buses, yeah. it's. And just the traffic jam. Like once mm-hmm. you get stuck in that, like... It's so hard to get out of it. So what time did you actually... Uh, uh, I reached here at 8, so that's two and a half. Wow! <laughs> so it probably had taken like maybe 30 minutes or an hour at most. You might as well be staying in Metro Manila then. <laughs> 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 well, I, yeah, I, that's, that's another thing that I wanted to bring up, actually, uh, the public transport system, because uh, even here in KL, we do... I think the trains are actually, the LRT and all, are pretty reliable. There's, there's a train every two minutes, and it's actually quite convenient. But when it comes to the bus, you do have to still wait for a very long time for, for the bus to come. And mm-hmm. once there's a traffic jam, there isn't much that you can do about it. You know, It's not yeah. like a train that can just mm-hmm. skim over the roads. You act, mm-hmm. They actually have to, to go through the traffic, and they don't drive that, that fast either. So mm-hmm. it can be a, a major inconvenience, which is why they're trying to build more uh, train station now. I don't know if you noticed. There's a lot of constructions mm-hmm. uh, going on all, all over KL right now. And I think that's it's a very good effort, but it's probably going to take... At least another one or two years before before we finish. And it's also by the time maybe the government builds like more train stations, people would ha- would already have had to use like or buy cars or at least some form of private transportation. That, that is true. So and I then, wonder like if people would just like discard them or like um, they, it's also about mindset of people, like encouraging them to use public transportation uh-huh. rather than use their like private cars, which many people see as a status quo. In yeah, I think societies. I think it affects us in so many different levels because then when you get a car, then you add, you don't realize you think it's going to be easier, but you're actually indirectly adding more to the traffic, the number of cars on the road, and then that in turn, uh, it still it still affects you. You know, you're you're still late for work, and uh, then you're also increasing the pollution and all, but. I do have, I still do have hope. I do think that when, probably when the train stations are all completed, if if it's more convenient by train, I'm sure more people will do that because I actually do have friends who have a car, but they, they still do prefer uh, commuting by train because it's a lot cheaper. And uh, I think the parking prices in KL, if you have a car and also the toll can can be a killer. It can be really, really expensive, especially uh, all those high-end shopping malls. So they actually prefer taking a train. So I hope that once all this is is complete, there will be more people who who, who get there, you know, uh, mentally, like to realize that it's actually a lot more convenient. Because sometimes it's also a matter of uh, the status thing. Like I don't want to take a train. You know, what are people gonna think about me? I I I, I want to drive a car. I want to have my own form of transportation. So it's a lot of things that 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 goes goes into that i think and which is mostly implicit that we don't necessarily think of 
Okay, I think uh, that's all we the time that we have today. It's nearly 8.30 now. So we're going to take a little break before we come back with our Blast from the Grassroots session. Uh, thank you very much, Aspot, for joining me this morning. Well, thanks, Gori. 